So if you have your Bibles this morning, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to read just a few verses, verses 5 through 7, uh, to get into our but God thinking this morning. And, uh, and then we'll jump into the message. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, we're going to read verses 5 through 7. Now, so Paul is speaking, For when we came into Macedonia, this body of ours had no rest, but we were harassed at every turn, conflicts on the outside, fears on the inside, but God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort you had given him. He told us about your longing for me, your deep sorrow, your ardent concern for me, so that my joy was greater than ever. So Lori's already talked about um, part of the message. She said she didn't have any inside knowledge of the message this morning, but she kind of used the opening illustration up. So I'm going to use it again just to launch into the sermon. Uh, we gather on Mother's Day and... Um, most of us um, can, can maybe remember um, some of our childhood, and, uh, but we can, some of us others can remember um, when our children were small. And it's interesting that for children, about 99% of them, when they are physically hurt, when they get their feelings hurt, when they think they're in trouble, what do they do? They run to the arms of who? Mama, right. And they would just bypass dad. I mean, I'd be like sitting there, and Preston or Diana would be needing something like comfort, and I'm standing there, and I'm available, and they're running by me like I don't even exist to get to Lori, right? And that's about 99% of the children. Now, there's 1% out there that would run to their father, if their father was there. But most of our children, they run into the arms of their mother. Why? Because women, and, you know, and then again, about 99% of women ha are born with, born with a natural characteristic that us men have, but we have it a, great, a greater degree you know, a lot lesser degree, a much less degree. And that's the ability to comfort and care. And that's just one of the, one of the many differences between men and women is, is that females, women, have the ability. They're given a God-given natural gift, most of them, about 99% of them, to, to be able to empathize, sympathize, give comfort and care while... Most of us men would say, hey, just throw some dirt on it. It'll, get, it'll be okay. You know, now there's about 1% of women that may do that. There may even be some in the sanctuary that would do that. I, that today, I don't know. It would be odd if it was, but there, you know, most men just say, hey, just throw some dirt on it. Get up. Let's go. You'll be okay. Get over it. Grow up. Act like an adult. You're a child, but act like an adult, you know. Mom say, no, 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 come on, honey, I, I, I know, it's, it's bad, isn't it? And they hug them up, and they comfort them, and they spoil them, and they give them whatever they want, right? I mean, that's just the way that is. And so, um, comfort is a big deal. We all need it. We, as children, we need it, and we ran to the arms of our moms. And as adults, most of us left in here now, we're adults, and we still need comfort. We haven't, we haven't abandoned that need. Grow, adulting, you know, as difficult as it is at times, it does not release us from the need to be comforted in our life. Because we encounter many situations almost daily, probably, almost daily, that require us at some level to need comfort. Many years ago, um, I was with one of the families in the church, and 
um, they were going through a very difficult situation, and, and the situation was about to get a little bit more difficult, and I, and I, I really had run out of things to say. I mean, I, I did literally had, had, had run out of things to say, and, and I knew what was a difficult situation that was ahead of us, so I just started praying, Lord, um, could you give me some words? Could you get something so that I can pour into this family? Now, a lot of times, and this kind of may be a helpful hint to you, a lot of times words aren't necessary. And a lot of times when we are begging for words, when we, try to, when we think we have to say something, we often say the wrong thing, or we say the inappropriate thing, or we say something that really doesn't help. And I understand that, but um, you know, I was a pastor, and I felt like I really needed something. So I was, I was praying, and I thought, Lord, just help me to help this family deal with this very difficult situation. And, and the Lord pointed me to Psalm 34. And I, I don't know if you're familiar with this text or not, and um, it, it's become special to me. It's Psalm 34, um, and it's verses 17 and, um, through 19. And I want to use this kind of as a, a supplementary text this morning to the but God in, in 2 Corinthians. But the psalmist is writing, and it's David. David wrote this psalm. Um, and if you have a, a Bible that gives you a little bit of information, um, listen to what it says about Psalm 34. Your Bible may have this. It says, it says, the psalm of David, when he pretended to be insane before Abimelech, who drove him away, and he left. Yeah, see, we all kind of need comfort at times. And this is what David said in Psalm 34, verses 17. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. A righteous man may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. Did you hear the sense of comfort in there? Did you hear, you know, the Lord, we can run into the arms of the Lord, and he will save us. He will comfort us. He says he is close to the brokenhearted. And so I was reminded of that as I, I read this text about, but God who comforts the downcast. Now, for a moment, I just want you to define downcast in your life. And th just start thinking of ways, all the different ways that, that you could become downcast. Well, Paul listed several for, for us. I want to list those for you, and I'm going to throw out a couple of more, and then I'm going to give us the solution. What is the comfort? Where does it come from? Paul says, first of all, that he was physically exhausted. He was physically exhausted. You know, that, that might not sound like the time that you need comforting, but look, when physical exhaustion becomes, becomes the norm and not the exception, you ever been there before? Have you ever been there where physical exhaustion is the, is the new normal you're living, and it's not just an occasional uh, thing that you run across in your life, but physical exhaustion, and that's where Paul was. And he says, that's just part of what was going on in my life, and that's part of what's going on in our life sometimes, when we get physically exhausted, it makes us vulnerable to so many other things. It also can make us spiritually weak. I just want to remind you of that when you become physically weak, you can become spiritually weak if you're not careful because you, it just grinds on you. It, it, it just gets you down. And you've you got to be aware. You've got to be on guard that when you become physically weak, at the same time, you can become spiritually weak. Be on guard. And he says, I was just... I was just, I had no rest. He was physically exhausted. And then he said he was harassed, but we were harassed or we were distracted. You know, the things that really don't matter, the things that, that, can, that may not be most important to us, but is important to something else, they were harassing us. They were distracting us. And distraction is a huge deal. And it's a serious deal. So, you know, trying to avoid distractions is important in our life. Trying to think, how can I deal with the distractions in my life? It's important that we do that. So thus, a fidget spinner. Now, if all of you don't know what this is, 
It's the latest craze. Last summer, it was Pokemon Go. This summer, it's a fidget spinner. Now, if you don't know what this is, it is a legitimate thing. It is a legitimate kind of toy. It, it, seriously, it is. For people like children diagnosed with attention deficit disorder, these were created to help them concentrate legitimately. Uh, so, you know, kind of counselors will tell you that. Um, people that are in, you know, psychology will tell you that. And so the, the, the deal is, is that when kids get distracted easily and they're not able to concentrate on what they need to concentrate on, they can do this without really paying attention to what they're doing. That solves their fidget kind of necessity. That causes their need to fidget because they have a legitimate disorder, and then they can concentrate on what they need to. So it was planned that, you know, you give this to a child, you send them to school, kind of under their desk, on, you know, without a whole lot of attention. They can just sit here with their hand, and you can sit here and do a lot of different things and just spin this, right? So it's called a fidget spinner. It keeps you from fidgeting. Now, the problem is, is that now every kid in America has one or wants one, one of the two. They either have it or they want it. So they start taking them to school. They start taking them to school, and what happens? Every child in school t brings them out. They start playing with them. The teacher says, put them up. They put them under the desk. You still have 30 kids in class or 25 or whatever it is, and they're playing. And, they're, and so instead of eliminating the distraction, they've what? They've become a distraction. So I believe in the Jasper City Schools, you can't have one of these now. And so a good has been eliminated because the masses abuse the privilege, right? In some schools, you can still have them. In others, you can't. I think Jasper City, you can't have them anymore. But we have to learn to deal with our distractions. Now, see, I can sit here and do this and talk. I can sit here and do this and preach. And what are you paying attention to? You're paying attention to see if this thing is still spinning, right? Well, I can tell you, it will spin for a long time. In fact, the other Wednesday night when I first got it, I spun it and I kept it going for a minute and a half. You think about that for a minute. Now, you know what's interesting about this one? So we were at Brookwood Mall last night, and there's a kiosk that had hundreds of them sitting there. While they last, $10 a piece. This one, y'all listen to this, it's amazing. This one was shipped from China. China. Now, I didn't purchase it. I just bought it from another person. Shipped from China. The cost of the fidget spinner and the shipment from China, $2. Two. Now, you figure that out. How did that happen? Well, don't figure it out because it'll make you mad when you figure out how it happened. You know. But we get distracted in a lot of ways. And sometimes the distractions, the, 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 the solution to the distraction becomes a distraction. Right? So you see how important that is? You see how easily we can get caught up in the things that distract us and then we find a solution and it becomes a distraction. And it becomes a harassment to our life. And we need to be able to run to the arms of God and say, Lord, I need some comfort in my distractions. I need comfort in what's harassing me. And then he said there's conflicting situation. There's conflict from without. Um, uh, it's still in verse 5. But we were harassed at every turn. Conflicts on the outside. Now most of us, that's probably the one that, that we can identify with most. Every person in here probably can identify the most is that surrounding us, not involving us necessarily, is a lot of conflict. But then we get drawn into it. We get... We get kind of sucked into it. We get, uh, it, it may look a little bit attractive, and so we move toward it. But there's conflict on the outside. Or it might be our own conflict. We might create conflict on the outside. We might create situations that are unhealthy. And God comes and comforts you. And then he said there's fears within. There's fears within. Uh, he listed a lot. There's fears within. Um... 
I mean, how many of you that are here this morning without one fear in your life? Without one fear in your heart? You know, every parent here, look, you know, every parent that's in this room today, you have fear, I guarantee you do. If you're a parent, you live with fear every day. And it involves your children. I said if you're a parent, every day you live with fear. Now, it may, it may not take a hold of you. On some days it may take a hold of you. On some days it may consume you. On some days it may break your heart. Is my child going to grow up in the way of the Lord? Is he, is he or she not? I mean, we have fears related a lot of different ways if you're a parent. If you're a, an elderly person here this morning, you have fears. If you're a young person here, you have fears. I was driving down the road. We were coming home last night. And, no, I, I, was, I was driving home from, I was out doing some things yesterday. Lori was down having a great time at Art in the Park. She was loving life. I was hating life because... I'd been to you know where, and it's always a bad deal when you go to you know where. And so, anyway, I was driving home, and I think, I'm just going to quit going out on Saturdays because it's just, it's, just, uh, it's just heartbreaking to go out sometimes and see the general public on Saturday. Now, I know that's a bad attitude for the preacher to have, right? But I'm trying to be real with you. And I was driving home, and I thought, man, I can't believe, you know, it's just... There's fear within me of what my children and my grandchild, my one grandchild gets to grow up in. I mean, can any of us say that life is getting better by the day to, to live and to grow up in? No, it, we're, we're in our mind we have a fear that it's bad and it's only getting worse. There are fears within all of us. Whether it's related to our children, if it's related to our own death and dying, well, I don't know, there's lots of fears within and Paul said, we need comfort for those. And then there's brokenness. I'm going to add a couple here. There's brokenness. There's brokenness. I mean, all of us have walked through periods of time in our life when we've been broken. Personally, or because of, but we've been broken. Our best friend turns their back on us. And we're broken. We have experienced death. We're broken. We experience illness. We're broken. All of those things come. And we experience brokenness in our life. And we don't know where to turn. We can't figure it out, but we're broken. And we don't see any answers in view. We don't incite there are no real easy answers. Right? Everybody got an answer for every piece of brokenness you've ever dealt with in your life? No, there's just not easy answers. But there is God who will comfort you. There is the, the message of the text, and we'll get there in a minute, is that God comforts the brokenhearted. And then you can be spiritually defeated. You can be spiritually defeated. You can be living and be walking with Christ and things happen. And all of a sudden your relationship with God begins to get distant. And what happens? You, you seem to sense that you're becoming spiritually defeated. And even in those situations. We run to the arms of God, and He comforts us. Because here's the good news. Even for Paul, and Paul listed all these things which were, he was dealing with. He was dealing with physical exhaustion, harassment, or distractions. He was dealing with conflict in his life. He was dealing with fears within. Even in all of those, and I've added brokenness, and spiritual, spiritually defeat. You need to hear this. You need to read again verse 6. You need to read two little words that change everything. But God. And you don't need to leave this morning without knowing that whatever situation you find yourself in, those things which 
are, are kind of on the negative side this morning. God will comfort you. God will stretch out his loving arms, the loving arms of the Father, and you get to run, just like as you did as a child, and ran to the loving arms of maybe your mother, or maybe not. And maybe that's why you need comforting this morning. It's because on this day in which you know, a lot of people are really celebrating. A lot of people are joyous. And we're, we're, it's a great day. And, and society has, has made a great day out of it. You come to this day for a lot of different reasons. And there's hurt and pain. And there's misunderstanding. And there's longing that you can't fulfill. It says, but God comforts us. First and foremost... God comforts us. And you need to live in that promise today. You need to live in the assurance that God will comfort you. And part of God's comfort is that he walks with you. Look, comfort doesn't come just because you run to the Father's arms or run to your parents' arms or run to whatever and they just grab you in, in, in for a moment and then send you away. No, God's comfort means that he embraces you and he holds you and he walks with you, and he cares for you, and he sees you through the fear within, the conflict without, the harassment, the brokenness, the spiritual defeat, all those. He walks. He's with you. What does the Bible say? He never leaves you nor forsakes you. You need to live in some of these promises, folks. If you want to live, if you want to live victoriously in Christ... We need to live in what the Bible promises us. And the Bible promises us in these two little words, but God, He comforts us. In the miracle of God, it says, He comforted us, God comforts us, through the people that He places in your life. God comforts and He uses the people that He places in your life. For Paul, he says this, but God comforts the downcast. Comforted us by the coming of Titus. So Titus played a role in comforting Paul. And then look what else he goes on to say. He goes on to say, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort that was given him. Can you imagine that? Now that's kind of a head scratcher. So this is how God works. This is how, why God is so good. So the Bible says, that text says, that if I were to comfort Sherry, then there could be somebody who comforted me that that is transferred through me to comfort her. Now, I'm not sure I even understand that and how that can happen. But the Bible says that's the way that happened. And if Jesus, if God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, it'll happen again. And so look, here's what we need to learn. Is that you can be comforted in the second generation of comfort. And you might be that comforter as well. What you offer to somebody else, they might turn around and offer to somebody else. And God used you to comfort them so that they could comfort somebody else. See, our comfort, but God, he comforts not only himself, but he uses people. And he uses people not just in the, in the first generation, but in the second, and maybe even the third. And because you comforted somebody, they might have gone and comforted somebody else. Is that not amazing? Is that not amazing? But the most amazing thing is, is that you cannot list. Now, we listed six this morning. Physical exhaustion, conflict or distractions, um, I mean, harassment or distractions, outward conflict, inward fear, brokenness, spiritual defeat. We named six. There's many more. There's many more. 
that in areas that we need comforted in. And here's two little words. And you need to live in this promise this morning. If you walked in this building this morning and you need comfort, be assured, but God will comfort you this morning. But God is in this place today to comfort you. And that may be the very reason you walked in this building today. You might not have known that ahead of time. But see, most of the time when God works in our life, we don't know it ahead of time. Right? You think of the times in your life when God has done the most in your life. Were you expecting it? Had you planned for it? Did you walk up to the door wherever it was and said, Hey, I, you know, here's what God is going to do in my life today. He's going to do this today. And let me tell you what that teaches you. We probably need to come to the presence of God with a little bit more expectation. We probably need to come to the presence of God with a little bit more expectation. Living in His promises. And this is a teaching moment for me. It's a teaching moment for me. Is that when I'm broken hearted, I need to expect God to comfort me. And God uses places and situations a lot of times more than others. And worship is one of them. And we ought to come into worship with a level of expectation that God will meet us at our point of need. And many of us came this morning thinking, I need comforting. And some of you didn't. But God is here to comfort you. Just like a mom does naturally. And God does, listen to this, supernaturally. God is here this morning to supernaturally capture your heart wherever it is today. Let's bow our heads and pray. God, come to people today. Come to people all over this sanctuary. People that may be watching us via the wonder of technology. Father, I just pray that, that you will come to people everywhere and just comfort them in their affliction. And Lord, we'll just use that word affliction to cover everything that they need comforting in today. Everything that hurts them, everything that brings fear, everything that causes conflict and chaos and crisis. Lord, that is affliction, and we just pray that you'll meet these people today, right now in this moment. In Christ's name we pray.